Hi, I'm Vinny Totterton, folks. Here we are again on the Friday show. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there before long, you will be lean and mean. And you know what? That's a guarantee. Or your money back. Oh, wait, this is free. All right. Money back guarantee. There you have it. Um, the Friday show is uh, I, I can easily say this is my favorite because I get these incredible luminaries on and they just give us this knowledge. And uh, look, I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, I, I learn more than, <laughs> than I think anyone else. You know, sometimes I go to dinner parties and what have you, and people, you know, I'll start talking and they'll go, how do you know all this? And it's like, I have these super smart people who come on my show every week and uh, they, uh, they let me know what it's all about. This person is absolutely no different. Um, she is, um, she's a professor at Colorado State University. She's on faculty there and uh, she knows a little something about animal science. Now, when you hear her name, you're going to go, wait a minute. I've heard that name before, probably because she was on, she was on uh, Time Magazine's 100 list at some point, I think around 2009, 2010. I usually have a pretty good memory about this stuff, but since I don't read or have any paper in front of me when I do these podcasts, I'm going to say 2010 because that's a nice even number. So I'm going to go with that. They called her a hero of the top 100. I mean, come on, hero. Look, I, I, this is just amazing. And the other reason you may know this name is because um, Claire Danes actually played her in a made for not TV, but I think it was on, I don't know where it was. I'm going to say HBO. Maybe she'll tell us. I'm talking about Dr. Temple Grandin. How are you doing, Temple? I'm doing just fine. Great to be here. Did I get any of that correct? <laughs> well, I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State. You got that right about the movie. Yeah. What is it like having uh, uh, someone of, of the Claire Danes uh, ilk just do your, you in the movie? What, was that very special for you? How does that work? Well, she kind of became me in the 60s and the 70s. Um, I spent about four hours with her. And then I gave her all these ancient old VHS tapes oldest ones I could get. And she played them over and over and over again, uh, working with, an, uh, with a movement coach and a, and a speech coach. Uh, and she became me. I also worked very closely with Emily Gerson Sainz, the director, Mick Jackson, who was a visual thinker, just like me. And they showed exactly how I think in that movie, in pictures. I really liked that. They also showed all the things that I had built and designed I liked seeing all my projects and seeing my actual drawings appear in the movie. You know, it, the movie wouldn't have been as, as special or nearly as good had they not shown those, how, you know, the cattle worked through that, you know, that maze that you had built and designed and all that. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. But, I, I, you know, it, I want to talk before we get into that about your autism, because okay. other than animal science, and being a doctor of that, you are pretty outspoken when it comes to autism. Well, I was uh, nonverbal till age four, had all the symptoms of autism, got into a very good early program at age two and a half. If you've got little kids that aren't talking, you've got to do something about it. Don't just let them watch uh, electronics all day. That's the worst thing you can do. Speech therapy, um, I had a lot of emphasis on learning how to wait and take turns in games really important. And then when I got into elementary school, uh, my ability in art was always encouraged. My mother encouraged art. She encouraged me to do lots of different kinds of art because that's what I was good at. And then art becomes part of um, you know my design work when I finally get got out in the industry. Here's some of my hand done drawings right there that are in Amazing. my book on um, thinking and pictures. Temple, do me a favor, hold that up again, because we're going to put this video up on YouTube. All right, let me get, uh, it, get it nice and clear. There you go. Um, it, it is pretty amazing. Uh, is that just some of the original art that you had Yeah, done? that's original hand-drawn art right there. That's um, Those are from the 80s. Wow. Hand-drawn art, and it's in my book, um, Thinking in Pictures. And it's important, the thing about being an autistic kid is the skills run even. 
So I'm a visual thinker. Everything I think about is in pictures. But then there's another kind of specialized mind, and that's the mathematical thinker, who's much more mathematical, more abstract, thinks in patterns, often loves music. And then you also have some people that are total verbal, uh, verbal thinkers. And yeah, I, you know, I have a lot to say about autism. What I've tried to do is combine the best science along with um, you know, in-person reports from people on the spectrum. I find some of the most valuable information has basically been the brain research and then write-ups that people on the autism spectrum have done explaining problems with sensitivity to sound, maybe sensitivity to light. It's again, it's variable. Uh, Dr. Grandin, uh, I'm gonna do a, a little quick math here. You're 73 years old. At yes. four years old, you were that, that was 69 years ago. Um, quite a while ago when we just labeled kids with any kind of um, uh, issues as just being retarded. That was well, that, that, that would be correct. In fact, actually, the first doctor mother took me to was a neurologist, which was mm -hmm. really lucky, a really good neurologist. And she did two things. She made sure I wasn't deaf. And she checked me for epilepsy, which I was normal on, no epilepsy. And then she recommended me to a little speech therapy school that two teachers taught out of the basement of their house. And there were maybe there were about two kids in the class with Down syndrome. I was labeled at the time minimal brain damage. Uh, the neurologists didn't know what autism was. But when you look back on all those symptoms and then all the diagnostic stuff I've had done since then, it's totally clear. I had classical autistic symptoms when I was a little kid. You know, it's interesting about what you just said. Um, and this was chronicled in my book, um, Fitness Confidential, 10 years ago. Um, I, you know, both of my parents were school teachers. You would think that they would have maybe figure this out. They were both great school teachers, stayed in, in the business for between them. They had well over 75 years of, of classroom experience. <clears throat> and by the time I was four, uh, I was being labeled as retarded. And, you know, because that was the term, folks, I'm not using this in a derogatory term. This was the term being used. Uh, you're absolutely time. right. Uh, the same thing got applied to me. Some people thought mm -hmm. I was retarded too. And one of the things that motivated me to um, uh, work on that dip fat project that was shown in the movie and shown very accurately, they recreated mm -hmm. a working replica of it that actually worked. And I, wanna, I was motivated to do that job because I wanted to prove I wasn't stupid. That right. was a very big motivator for me in the 70s. Yeah, you know, it's funny, and we're going to talk about that. But my thing was, you had mentioned that your doctor, the neurologist checked you for hearing. Um, they didn't check me for hearing. And it, as it turned out, I was legally deaf. And that's the reason that my speech patterns were off. I wasn't learning at the same rate as other kids and, and what have you. And it was accidentally figured out for me, when I was five, four or five, I think I was early five, when um, I walked out into a street and a car slammed on the brakes and skidded and hit the horn and the whole thing. And I didn't flinch. The kindergarten teacher said, oh, my God, this kid didn't hear anything that was going on. Uh, so when we took a nap that afternoon, she came up behind me while all the kids were napping and she took a couple of two by fours and clacked them together. Everyone else in the class woke up except the guy that had the clacking happening right behind him, which was me. Um, and then, you know, they were able to correct my hearing. I, I have most of my hearing back. It was a couple of operations. And uh, and then there was years and years of speech impediment. I I overcame it by becoming very physical. I ended up becoming a football player. Uh, I was always trying to overachieve in school, even though I, I still had that, peach in, 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 that speech impediment. I still have it apparently right now uh, going into high school. Uh, it was being fixed along the way. I was uh, speech therapy and the whole thing. And uh, I was always trying to overcompensate or overprove myself. And, I, and I, I really think that that's why I made it to any degree of uh, a normal life. What say you? Uh, obviously, you've achieved a lot. You, you, you're a PhD. You have degrees up to yin yang. They're making movies about you. By God, Time Magazine is calling you one of the heroes uh, of, of the top heroes of, of 2010. How does that make you feel? Do, do you feel like you always have to overachieve? And do you still feel like you have to do that today? 
Well, right now, people have asked me how I feel about all the attention I've gotten. I said, I consider it a responsibility. I've got a lot of kids looking up to me. In fact, I just did a, um, a talk uh, this morning to uh, about a thousand school kids on my book, Outdoor Scientist. And what basically is in that book is all the <clears throat> things that we did as kids on uh, collecting rocks, uh, collecting shells and making things out of them, uh, looking at stars, trying to find satellites, uh, making daisy chains, making tents um, out in the woods, just things that we, we did, which kids aren't doing today. We have a lot of kids living in the neighborhood. You never see them outside. They're totally removed from world of physical things. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I look around at, you know, when I was a kid and I'm, I'm 58 years old, I'll be 59 in a few months. And I had a Zippo lighter when I was a kid. My grandfather gave it to me and it was full of fuel and I was able to use that lighter, not to smoke cigarettes, but if I wanted to light a fire, you know, uh, burn some leaves or do whatever. I don't know why he, I had a pocket knife when I was seven, eight, nine years old. I had a pocket knife. There was a certain responsibility oh, yep. for that pocket knife. Sitting on my mantle here, uh, I don't think you can see it from where we are, but sitting on my mantle, I have a, uh, a shotgun, a 410 shotgun from 1875. It's a vintage shotgun. Uh, the reason I bring up that gun is because it's made in child size. Because back then, children would shoot shotguns. They, they would have to go out and, and, and bring food in in the late 1800s. We were still doing that. And now we're teaching kids that we need to eat fake meat and we shouldn't even have meat. And, you know, and I, I think well, every time I, I want to talk, I, I want to talk about my experiences with tools. Okay. I have another little book called Calling All Minds. And um, when I was in second grade, I was using a hammer, a screwdriver, and pliers. And I was taught, you know, safe use of them. All the kids in our neighborhood used tools. And I made a little parachute and I had to, I cut, to cut coat hangers. I can remember doing a little kid's hands, had to squeeze both handles of the pliers. And I couldn't um, cut through the coat hanger, but I could dent it. And then I'd have to bend it like this. And I was making a little cross arm thing <laughs> for my parachute that was made from a scarf. Yeah. So that would open more easily. But yeah, I grew up using tools. We've got kids growing up today. They never use a tool. This is ridiculous. Everybody in my neighborhood in the 50s um, used tools. And we were taught to use them carefully. Yeah, it, it is amazing that we we're not there anymore. And it would be great if we can go back to that. You know, uh, I know there's some schools out there, you know, there, there's the Waldorf school and some of the stuff where they let kids kind of run free and play with different things and uh, let them get scraped up and all that. But it's just not enough. Uh, hang on just a second while we pay the bills here, folks. Bell Campo, we're going to be talking a lot about cattle today. Bell Campo is doing it right. Bellcampo.com. Uh, we get that meat delivered here by Bell Campo. Anya Fernald is doing a great job up there. I think Dr. Grandin would be very proud of what they do with that meat. It's all uh, grass is grazed, grass fed. Uh, they do it the right way. The slaughtering process, all of it. I've checked it out. Bellcampo.com. Go check them out. Folks, if you put in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, you get 20% off. I don't even want to call Bell Campo at this point because they might realize that they left a 20% discount code in for me and they might cut it to 10%. I don't want that to happen. 20% off if you put in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y at Bell Campo. Also, uh, if you spend over 100 bucks after that 20% discount, you get free shipping. That's huge whenever you get something that heavy shipped to your house because they have to pack it in dry ice and what have you. And that makes it a heavy package. Um, I like to buy a lot of it all at once. So that, you know, I can save on some of that packaging. You're just a lot of meat all at once. Fill up the deep freezer. Bellcampbell.com. Don't fall asleep on those meatballs. They are Vinny friendly, as we like to call them. NSNG friendly. Bellcampbell.com. Promo code Vinny. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Temple Grandin. We're learning a lot about tools. We're learning a lot about art. I'm learning a lot about this woman. Dr. Grandin, when is it that you started realizing that you cared about animal welfare, livestock, what have you? 
actually, I came from a non-ag background, and I didn't get introduced to cattle till I was a teenager. Now, that brings up another really important thing. How did students get interested in things? Well, exposure. I had the opportunity to go out to my aunt's ranch. I'd never been in the West before, and I'm, then I got introduced to it. Um, and when I first started out, I was really interested in all the design, how to design a really efficient facility that was shown in the HBO movie. And then later on, as people got more and more interested in animal welfare, I designed some of the um, some of the very first systems for auditing animal welfare at meat plants. I, I did this based on a survey I did for the USDA back in 1996, measuring five very simple things. And that's now being used around the world. I worked on implementing that back in 1999. I'm, they, uh, when I first started in the 70s, cattle handling was absolutely terrible. And it has improved a whole lot compared to 1970s or even you know 10 or 15 years ago it's improved a whole lot people are realizing you see you know we're good welfare but also right. you're going to have less bruises and you're going to have better meat quality and better growth what made them listen to you of all people hey, hey here's a little lady with uh, some drawings here why would they pay attention to you what, what what happened there had to be an aha moment or something happened where they went wait a minute this this lady's on to something. Well, what start, started out, first of all, selling the equipment. I found that selling a fancy cattle handling system was a whole lot easier to do than getting people to operate it correctly. And really, really early in my career, a small contractor seeked me out to work with me. He'd seen my drawings and he wanted to start building these things. And so um, the very first jobs we, you know, he did the building, I did the designing. And I kind of made the mistake that a lot of people in engineering make when they're young, they think they can fix management problems with engineering. You cannot. And I got a lot of equipment out there. Getting equipment out there wasn't that hard, but I was really frustrated on some of the bad behavior that went on in this equipment. Then there was an event that made it change. And this was like riding a giant surf wave. Uh, if you look up online, there's a lawsuit called McLibel. This would be back in the um, early 90s, McLibel. Spell and that for us, Temple, so that we can... Uh, it's I'm like go Muck, M-C, and then the word libel. You know how McDonald's puts an M-C like, like on McDonald's, everything? Like McDonald's, but McLibel. Yeah. Okay. McLibel, and a small environmental uh, group had put out a brochure about McDonald's doing all this terrible stuff, wrecking rainforest, forest, torturing pigs, uh, torturing chickens, just, uh, everything terrible. McDonald's sued them wasted a lot of money suing them. And the environmental group won half the case. They lost on the rainforest stuff, but they won on the pigs and the chickens not being treated right. So now this big company was forced to look at the issue. I was hired, I was doing consulting at the time on handling. I was hired to introduce the executives of McDonald's to their first trips to farms and slaughter plants. And it was very interesting watching animal welfare go from an abstraction that you delegate to the legal department or you delegate it to the public relations department, go to something real. I'll never forget the day when Bob Langert saw a half dead dairy cow go into his product. Now, Bob Langert, one of the ones that person that hired me and kept the, it kept everything going. He has a book called the battle to do good. Yeah. You might not look at that. And, and uh, then I got involved with their supply chain management people. And they went out and they saw bad things. And then six months later, Wendy uh, came in with a really, really good system. So now they'd seen these bad things. Now, meanwhile, I'd already developed the simple auditing program based on this USDA survey. And it had been published uh, by the American Meat Institute by, by my friend, Janet Riley. But nobody used it. I taught McDonald's how to use it. And uh. let me tell you, when a big company like that wants things changed, it works. And the other thing that made it work, it had five simple critical control points. Stunning efficacy was the first one. You couldn't shoot 95% of those cattle dead on the first shot, you get booted off the supplier list. Wow. If more than three of those animals, 3% of those animals bellered in the stunning area, you'd fail. If more than 1% fell down anywhere in the handling facility, you failed. And then we scored them electric prod score. Everything had to be dead when you hung it on the roll, rail, otherwise you'd fail and there were acts of abuse, automatic failure. Very simple. 
It's picking out the right things to measure. It's just like traffic. If I just measured drunk driving, speeding, stopping violations, texting, uh, and seat belts, I'd probably get 95% of the safety. Those are the critical control points. Right. And the plant knew exactly what they had to do. It was clear. It wasn't some vague stuff like handle them properly. It was clear. They had to make their numbers. And the good news is that out of 75 suppliers on the McDonald's supplier list, only three had to buy expensive equipment. I bent over backwards to do reverse conflict of interest. Even though I had equipment I could sell them, I didn't try to sell them equipment. I tried to make whatever they had work. And we were able to do this on all but three plants. I, I also had to remove the managers from three plants and then things changed. Wow. And it was like, wow, in six months, it changed. They were forced to repair stuff and manage stuff. It was just amazing. And, and when a big company like that moves, you can really change things. But the other reason it worked, it was extremely practical. Yeah. And it wasn't complicated. See, a lot of stuff with regulations now, they've got European regulations that says prevent avoidable suffering. Right. How do I measure that? That's so, that's so vague. It's, it's too vague. vague. Yeah. Because the problem is, is that when you kick somebody off the proof supplier list, it has to be clear as to why they're getting delisted. That's what it's called in the industry, getting delisted. You have to, it has to be clear. And that's why it worked. And then Wendy's came in six months later with a great program. Burger came in, King, King came in and did it. And I made sure that everybody kept it the same. You don't, you, you, you because you need to have a base standard for the whole industry. It was amazing. What year I was, was sitting that? in conference that rooms and saying, fix the broken stunner, fix the loading ramp that's the skating rink. You know, you've got to fix these things. What so year are we talking about when the McDonald when McDonald says, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to follow these guidelines. What year are we talking about? It was 1999. Okay, 1999. So it was like a massive tipping point. So this is all fairly new. Everything we're talking about is just brand new. Yeah, right? it's like just over 20 years old. Yeah. It, where are we now? Obviously, it's not completely fixed. There's still work to be done. What are we working on now? What are you working on now to, to further this? The biggest problem now, the slaughterhouse is actually very easy to fix because most of the time we're able to fix it with um, simple changes, management, maintenance. Where are the issue now? In the farms, there's some issues that are going to be harder to fix. And there's issues about housing. Well, that's going to be expensive to change. I'm also concerned about pushing an animal's biology to the point where the animal starts to have problems. We've got congestive heart problems now in cattle, mm -hmm. congestive heart failure. Really? Cattle. We never had that before. And some of this is genetics. You're just breeding more and more for production. We've got lameness problems in feedlot cattle that we never had before. You know, I was, I was like so happy when I got the slaughterhouses fixed. And then like 10 years later, we started getting cattle and young feedlot cattle that had difficulty walking and they were all stiff. Ugh. And it's, it's what I call biological overload. You push an animal too hard, but I'm going to bash on pets too. This is a situation where the bulldog's overselected for an appearance trait and it can't breathe, it can't walk, and it can't have its babies naturally. Right. And that's equally bad. But that, that, this, then when you try, I try to fix that, I get a lot more pushback. We hear a lot, you know, I, I live in Virginia near Polyface Farms. Uh, I've, I've seen what they do there. It's all ethical. It's all done correctly. I, I have a sponsor here on the show. I just mentioned Belcampo. Yep, They're doing that. it right. Um, but we hear this term factory farming, factory farming. We got to get rid of factory farming. Well, that's used way too. Uh, what is it? it? It seems vague to me. Whenever people start... I was like, yeah, 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 factory farming. All right, let's, okay, let's just go through the thrower. species. Let's yeah, start absolutely. with species. Let's right. start with beef. Okay, cows and calves in beef, Angus cattle, for example, um, are raised out on pasture. It doesn't matter where the meat is sold, whether it's sold into a high-end welfare program or sold into just regular grocery store, cows and calves are out on pastures. Okay. That's the same. And then you have some that's strictly grass-fed, but even on the natural beef, you know, they'll put them in feed yards, at least, you know, for a short time. So beef, it's like the least, you know, restrictive environment. 
it's actually an educational term, the least restrictive environment, would be for beef. Now, where you get into the biggest issues with the housing is with pigs and with laying hens. There's two kinds of chicken here. You've got the broiler chicken and you've got the laying hen. And when I first was taken by McDonald's in to look at um, uh, chickens crammed in very small battery cages, I was horrified. They, the, the ceiling was so low they couldn't even stand at their normal posture. They couldn't even sleep without being on top of each other. And I remember wow. having a conversation with the grower and I said, well, what if I brought 10 people out here from the Chicago airport? What do you think they'd think? I said, I think they'd be horrified. And the next day he called me up and he goes, you really made me think about that 10 people from the Chicago airport. I hadn't thought of that before. You see, people can get so used to looking at something that's bad that you get bad becoming normal. That's kind of happened with some of the lameness issues now in beef cattle. They're so used to looking at them, they're not seeing them. Right. There's actually been studies done that have shown that if you've never measured the lameness and you estimate it, you will underestimate by half. Wow. Yeah. Three refereed scientific studies done in dairy cattle. It doesn't matter whether it's dairy cattle or beef cattle, but the lameness will be underestimated by half. In fact, I've got a textbook on animal welfare right here, brand new uh, third edition of improving animal welfare practical approach. Guys, by the way, if you if you want to see what we, we're doing, this video is going to be on Vinnie Tauterich's YouTube. Dr. Grandin's holding up uh, over the course of this podcast, several different books. So you want to go check that out. Also, some of her drawings. Um, so it's, it's pretty fascinating what I'm seeing here. So if you want to see that, it's on Vinnie Tauterich's YouTube channel, um, where this show will also be. Uh, most of most people, Dr. Grandin, uh, consume this show while they're in the car on the well, yeah, you know, the yes, treadmill really or whatever, and they like just that. listen to it. But I want them to go watch what you're doing here. Um, all right, go on. So we're talking about factory farming, and you're talking about well, the, they, the things that probably, when you think of that term, factory farming, that probably would apply to the most would be uh, pigs, uh, indoor pigs, where they're in stalls where they can't turn around for gestation, right, and. Bat small battery cages for hens. Now, a lot of the uh, hen houses, they're coming up with some better systems now where the birds are, you know, they may be on decks, but they're free to go around between the different decks. Right. Uh, and there's been some um, cage-free systems that have not worked well. You see, this gets into the whole equipment development thing. But the term factory farm gets, you know, used, just thrown around and you look at something like the way I look at it is you're going to have all your specialty markets. Okay. Pigs outside, for example, something like that. And then you, I'm going to just call it indoor intensive farming. I'm, I've seen some very well done indoor pig farming and I've seen absolutely terrible. And some of the absolutely terrible was the mismanagement broken equipment category, mm. similar to the, to the slaughter plants. Right. Right. You know, there's a certain segment of the industry, it, what's happening right now, this problem, the beef cattle being lame and having things wrong with them. I want to make it very clear. It's a, I'm going to call it a significant minority. It's not the majority of the industry, but it's also not a half a percent either. Right. More like 10 or 15% doing some stuff that's pushing cattle too hard, not putting roughage in the feed. Then you get really bad liver abscesses and they'll bring them in on the night shift at the meat plant. Uh, you know, that's done on purpose. Your day shift's just fine. They got to slow the line way down the night shift because the cattle are so messed up. Right. But there's a significant minority that, that's doing this stuff. I'll also tell you, they're the ones that do not have a buyer who's auditing them. Mm. I have seen there's a big difference between the products where a buyer is auditing them and where a buyer is not auditing them. Well, that's, that's human nature. You know, I've always said you can find successful people because... The most successful people in the world are people who do things right, even when no one's watching. Well, then, right? and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people doing things right. I know family ranchers that are really doing a good job taking care of the land. Yeah. They're not getting enough credit for that. And this gets into another thing in beef, because I've been doing a lot of thinking about, um, you know, eating meat and cattle when they're done right, sheep and goats would be in the same category. They, their manure fertilizes the land. You do the grazing right, it will improve the land. You do it wrong, you can wreck the land. But animals, the grazing animal is part of the land. You talk to any agronomist in private, I've talked to a bunch of them, monoculture of crops is bad. Yeah. 
They're well, reluctant look, I, to say I've it had, in public, but they'll tell you in private. Oh, listen, I've had guys, uh, Peter Bellistat has been on this show half a dozen times saying we need these ruminants. We need them out there saving the land. And uh, of course, you'll hear from the other side and, and uh, they're, they're, the other side is just making up lies. And I, I just interviewed a guy uh, yesterday, I think it's coming out be right before this podcast, the Friday before this podcast. I had a guy on uh, who was talking about, um, you know, what's going on with the atmosphere and the greenhouse gases and how, you know, we get these throw words, just like you were talking about, I mean, you know, factory farming is used too much. We hear about greenhouse gases. Yeah, it's a problem, but it's not coming exactly from where some people would like to think, have you think is coming from. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I go, I walk in the grocery stores, it's like a comedy routine, you know, I've always said, you know, whenever you start making a word, something like vegan became a thing, you, or you think vegan is what vegan, you hear keto or, you know, you oh keto is something. And now you're hearing grass fed this and uh, free range that and there, there is no one who is actually there to regulate that anybody. Can, I can have a chicken cooped up in a cage and still say, hey, these were free range chickens because we they saw some sunlight one day. There is no one actually regulating this stuff, is it, Dr. Granton? Well, there are some things that like USDA organic, for example, had that's inspected. You see, there are some USDA grades, but I do a lot of consulting with, um, you know, both regular commercial, let's call them that, and uh, also with the niche markets. And one thing I tell people, your label better be accurate. Yeah. Uh, let's just call it if you it, it can be fraud otherwise, plain and simple. I remember, I'm not going to say whose egg carton this was, but about 10 years ago, I went in a store and we'll make, keep the name of the store out of it too. And I found some egg cartons in there and they had silhouettes of chickens grazing on pasture. Mm -hmm. I knew the head of supply chain management for that company. I called them up. I said, are those chickens outside on pasture? They went, nope. I said, you know what? Those egg cartons need to disappear. Yeah. And she didn't even realize that the egg cartons were out there. Six months, uh, about four months later, they were gone. They, they said they wanted to use up the, all the boxes. And as soon as they were used up, they didn't order any more. And she agreed with me that that picture of the silhouette of chicken grazing on their egg carton was wrong. Right. And they got rid of them. You see that it, it implies that the chickens were outside on grass, which they were not. They were what's called a barn egg where they're inside, but they walk around on litter inside the barn. Right. That's not, that's, that's uh, cage free, but that's not free range. Free range usually implies they go outside and right. their chickens did not go outside on pasture. The egg cartons did disappear. Here's my no. issue. You know, you're one person and you walked into one store and you found a carton that was, you know, not it wasn't blatant, but they had a picture of chickens walking around outside, which would, you know, the connotation is I would hey, imply. that's right. But how we only have one Temple Grand and, and you can't walk into every store and you well, cannot, no. you know, how do we how do we turn this into something where we can make this a real thing? I'll tell you one thing you got to do when we spend supply chain failures. I don't care if it's pharmaceuticals, whether it's clothing. Uh, supply chain manage management people have got to get their butt out of the office and see what's going on in their factories. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, oh, I should have brought this down for a prop. I've got some little kids' jeans that came from a factory to burn down and it killed a, a hundred people. Oh. And this horrible thing happened because the suits didn't get out of the office to where the factory was and get on the pack off. I don't care if you're making pallets of jeans or pallets of meat, it's still the pack off where they load the trucks. And then you're gonna know how many jeans they could make in this factory. And they ordered more jeans than the factory could make. So the factory subcontracted. There was a subcontractor that burned. So corporate of this company goes, oh, we didn't buy from that factory. Well, the office did not burn. And the activists went in there and found the labels and the receipts. Wow. The suits bet to get out of the office. I don't care if it's meat or whether it's clothing. And then there was a real mess with the uh, heparin, you know, the blood thinner uh, with raw materials coming from really disgusting sources. And it's uh, suits have got to get out of the office because when, if you're running a supply chain, I don't care what it's for, there's three legs on a tripod. 
like you put a camera on. Right. If it doesn't have three legs, it's going to fall over. Absolutely. And you have you can go third party independent auditing company, and then you can go corporate audits. Basically, what I started in the beginning was corporate audits. Then each supplier has to do internal audits. And where supply chains have failed is the suits sometimes didn't get out of the office and find out what their factories are doing. I've just watched this fiasco with this vaccine factory. You really? mix up ingredients, two different types of vaccine, two different companies of vaccine. You contract lab and you mixed the wrong ingredients together, you dinglings. Is this for human or animals? No, this is for humans. Wow. And and it's just sloppy. And and I don't care if you're running a meat plant or a vaccine factory, there's certain principles, what's called HACCP, hazard analysis, critical control points, and SOP, standard operating practices, good manufacturing practices. And this place violated them all. And their CEO, when he he appeared on TV, what a jerk. No, they were not, he needed to head get his butt out of the office and go in there and clean up some of the stuff they were doing. Well, do we they know were, they, about this? Is this something you could talk about? Well, they, well it, yeah, it was in the papers. It was in the papers. It's that um, um, I was, they were making the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and they put AstraZeneca stuff in it is from it, the other company. It's in the New York times. Is this, was this the part of what's going on now with this COVID? Well, they had to throw away millions of doses of vaccine, millions of doses, never got to the public. Really? Never got to the public. So no one got injected. Away. No one was injected with the. No, no, no. It was thrown away long before it got to where they fill and finish in the little vials. Wow. Oh, no, it didn't get anywhere near anybody, but it was sloppy manufacturing. The same kind of stuff that I dealt with back in 1999. We had to make the meat packing plants clean some stuff up. It's, it's crazy. just uh, it, management's got to make sure that you're doing things right. And you. Right you mix the ingredients together from two different companies. I, that's just sloppy. And the FDA tore them apart, tore them apart. Good. Well, well, they should. They and, tore them apart, and I think they, what they also did is they fired all the managers. Uh, but it's, it was basic stuff. Uh, in manufacturing, there's some real basic stuff. It's the same for a lot great. of different things. And when there's been real problems, you got, the financial people and the private equity people, um, what they're doing to doctor's offices now in hospitals is pretty disgusting. I, I read some pretty disgusting things in the Wall Street Journal. Buy a hospital and, uh, and then the, take the land they used to own and rent it back to the hospital and make it go broke. Oh. Yeah, that's like, no, we need more people in this world that are going to do real things, actual real things, not just, you know, suck the, get short-term profits out of it and just suck all the way. Well, that, that's what corporations do, unfortunately. And um, we, we, yeah, I, I yell about, you know, doctors and hospitals all the time. And I'm constantly saying, well, it's not really the doctor's fault. You know, they, they, they are contracted by these larger corporations and they have to read right off the script. They don't get to be doctors anymore. They don't get to quote unquote practice at being doctors. They're reading off of a script and, and it, they'll say, look, if someone's total cholesterol is over some number, give them a statin. If their A1Cs are this, give them metformin. If they, and right down the line, and most of these doctors don't even believe what they're doing, but they have houses and cars and kids in private school and what have you. And they also have loans to pay back and they get screwed. Hang on just a second, Temple, because I want to get into, I know you gained some weight at one time and then lost some weight. I want to talk to oh, you. Oh yeah, about we need that. to talk about my weight gain. Yeah, I, I, I don't worry. We, I, I need to find out how you keep yourself lean and mean. Folk, my company, Pure Vitamin Club, is one of the sponsors of this show now. Um, we were just talking about GMP. We use good manufacturing practices at purevitaminclub.com. As a matter of fact, I don't stop right there. This is my company. As everyone knows, the reason I started my own vitamin company was because kind of like Dr. Grandin, I started looking at everything that was going in my body. And I realized that they were putting things like magnesium stearate and titanium dioxide and everything else in these supplements that are supposed to make you do better and perform better in life. Yet they had products in there that could cause cancer, even in nanoparticles. I had enough of it. I put my money where my mouth was. I started purevitaminclub.com. That company 
has been around now for seven years. And by the way, I don't just go by GMP. I literally pull my vitamins off the line and have them privately tested to make sure, you know, that that's me making sure the efficacy of what I'm talking about is actually happening. So um, that's what we do at purevitaminclub.com. You can go check them out at purevitaminclub.com. We have an assortment of products over there and we have more coming out. I've been working on my EPA DHA formula, my fish oil formula for well over 18 months. Everyone's been begging me to put out a fish oil and I would not do it until I got it perfect. And I'm almost there. It will, I don't want to say, I think Andy's telling me by June, we should have it in stock. I'm very proud of that product. Go check it all out at Pure Vitamin Club. Dot com. We're talking to Dr. Temple Grandin. Temple, you and I had a conversation a week or two ago, and you you were asking me who I am and what I did and how I did it. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm this guy that tells people to eat more fat to lose weight. And uh, we started having, and you just went berserk on that. You said, oh, yeah, that, same here. Tell your story, if you don't mind. Well, I mean, I try to eat reasonably healthy, and I can remember the uh, the uh, low fat, the absolute low fat carb craze. Okay, so a plate of pasta is, um, you know, low fat, um, and I tried this, and I was having a muffin for breakfast, having a bagel sandwich for lunch. I gained thirty pounds, thirty wow. big ones. Wow! And I'll tell you how I got them off. Well, I cut down on the bread and the pasta, and ate a lot more fruits, whole, uh, no. Uh, no juices, just whole fruits, vegetables, meats, um, and the weight just came off. And also another advantage was I wasn't hungry all the time. When I was eating all those bagels and muffins, by 11 o'clock, I'd be all hungry. And and I felt, uh, during COVID, I've managed not to gain weight. Uh, the pants I used to wear out on the road, I was off the road for an entire year, uh, no flights for a whole year. Now yeah. that I'm vaccinated, I am getting back on airplanes. But I was very happy that a year later, the pair of pants um, that I used to wear on the road still fits and they're not tight. Nice. So, you you know, most people were gaining at the beginning of COVID. I said, you know, there's going to be a COVID-15, kind of like the freshman 15 with girls in college. Um, but it wasn't the COVID-15. It looks like it became the COVID-30. A lot of people. No, it wasn't. COVID. It. This was way before. COVID. This is way that before. But yeah, a lot before. of people did yeah. gain weight with COVID. And at the beginning, I said, folks, instead of gaining weight, since we're all sitting around anyway, how about you do some push ups, sit ups, chin ups, if you can just do stuff around your house and put on five pounds of muscle instead of putting on 15 or 20 pounds worth of fat, that would be much healthier. And um, of course, a few people did that. But for the most part, COVID took a toll when it comes to people's health. I don't think we've even began to see began to see what's going to happen or what COVID caused aside from a lot of people losing a loved one, right? What say you on the subject? Well, the other thing is I just, um, you know, cut out uh, bagels. I don't, there's just too much bread there. I cut a lot of bread out of the diet. And for breakfast, I'll have a little bit of sausage, some fruit, and then some whole grain, little biscuit things I get. Uh, or I cut up fruit and have it with yogurt with a little trail mix on it. That'll be breakfast. I have, um, I, you know, some beef with broccoli for lunch. I had cut down on just tons and tons and tons of carbs, but the, I, I have to have some fat. If I don't have some fat in the morning, then by 1030, I'm getting all headachy. And this brings up another thing. When I was much younger, I've tried going vegan. There's no way I could go vegan. Really? Think, nope. There's just no way. Get too lightheaded. I got to have some animal protein. You know, when I tried doing peanut butter, that just doesn't do it. I don't have to eat a pound of steak. I don't need that. Right. But I've got to have a certain amount of animal protein. My mother's exactly the same way. Really? Yep. She's exactly the same way. I'll never forget a dinner one time. She hadn't had any animal protein that day and she was getting really cross and we had a lot of appetizers like potato skins and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the restaurant was busy and really slow. All she could think about was her burger. And she, what I do with burgers is I don't eat the buns lots of times. So I just eat right. the burger. And, and as soon as she got that burger and, and took the bun off, you know, like 20 minutes later, she was all happy. Yeah. 
That's all it takes. You know, we, we, as we say around here, meat heals. I eat red meat every single day of my life. Um, I, I don't, I don't miss a day. Uh, I have fish probably three or four times a week. And uh, it, it's, it's what heals is what keeps us healthy. And it drives me crazy that we, the government is talking about less and less meat. And now we're going into this whole crazy fake meat industry. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think we need to be looking at our supply chains here. And I can tell you, I've learned a lot about supply chains working with McDonald's and Wendy's. And there's a lot of different ingredients that go into those products. Each one of those ingredients has a supply chain that involves harvesting equipment and involves trucks and trains, you know, to move ingredients and looking at the energy use for the two products. I, I don't think it's going to be as efficient as they think because you've got a complicated ingredient list and that has to be looked at carefully. Um, the grazing animals, um, if we, use, we need to be using them right to improve land. Right. That's something that we need to be doing. Well, look, you know, I, I, I've been working on my next movie where I'm going to be talking a lot about veganism and these impossible meats and, and, and burgers and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, one of the things I, I found through study is, and I didn't have to look that deep to find this. Anyone can find this. You talk about supply chains. A lot of stuff is coming from China. So when you think about something that's originating on the other side of the world, and then it's going to end up here, you know, there, there's a lot of diesel fuel that had to. Well, that, well, that's absolutely right. I'll give you an yeah. example of something that's not sustainable. And I've got a chapter on sustainability and improving animal welfare, a practical approach. I thought it was the dumbest thing I ever heard of. There's no way it's sustainable. You cut trees down in the southeastern U.S. Then you make them into wood pellets or wood chips, put them on a boat, send them over to England, to the United Kingdom and burn them in a power plant. There is no oh. way that's sustainable. I, no. I couldn't believe we'd no, be no. doing something like that. You see, but when you look at some of the renewable fuels, if you do it local in moderation, then they're sustainable. But if you go too much of it, then you're plowing up cropland to you know, raise the, the fuel crop on that you shouldn't be plowing up. You know, it's a little bit of sustainable fuels is good. Right. Too much of it, then you're taking pasture land that ought to remain as pasture and growing corn on it. Well, you know, I had, making it into ethanol. I had Dr. Mitlerner on the show last week or a week before, and he was saying that um, they're now trapping some of the uh, methane that's being put out by uh, dairy cattle, and they're using that methane. They can turn that into fuel that could be used in, in equipment, agriculture equipment, trucks, and what have you. Do you know anything about that or how well, that's What they're doing out? is that they're capturing methane off of manure lagoons. Mm -hmm. Also, some of the big meat packing plants are doing that. And you can Google Earth the big meat packing plants and see the uh, covers that are over the lagoons. And then they're using that for power generation or steam generation in the plant. And you could do the same thing you know, on a dairy farm. I know some pig farms are also been are also doing that. And then you burn that methane. Uh, yeah, you're gonna use for fuel. But people forget natural gas is methane. Right. Right. People forget that. And Another thing that can be a big factor is if you this gets back to management again, you've got to manage your oil wells and manage your equipment so you don't let methane escape. Right. Because if you have leaky equipment, uh, that puts a lot of it into the atmosphere. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Mitt Lerner was telling me that uh, when you talk about cattle and, you know, the, the naysayers will say, oh, the, the burping, the cattle burping is causing the ozone layer to, you know, they're filling up the greenhouse gases. He was telling me it's something like 0.03% versus if you look at the effectiveness of, of veganism, if we all went vegan, it, the effect would be 2.4 or 2.6%. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just throwing the numbers around here. I'm not sure if they're exactly accurate, but it was something like that. And it's an amazing amount of energy it takes just to get a carrot in your mouth versus a hamburger, right? Yet we're not looking at that the right way. Well, I think a lot of things, it's moderation. And the, one of the things we need to be doing for soil health is integrating cattle grazing with crop rotation. Right. And I'm reading more and more in my cattle magazines that I get, you know, really progressive people are doing it more and more. But unfortunately, there's some economic incentives that, you know, incentivize monoculture. But the right thing to do is rotating crops, 
Uh, the other problem you've got is these big supply chains are extremely fragile. I did a, mm -hmm. I did a little article for Fortune uh, magazine on, on uh, uh, no, excuse me, Forbes, Forbes magazine mm -hmm. on uh, big is fragile. Okay, like during COVID, the uh, big uh, plants got shut down and people got sick. Think about big. It's the same thing for big container ships too. The mm -hmm. Ever Given getting stuck in the Suez Canal. Uh, when it's very efficient, like per animal for a slaughterhouse or per shipping container, the big boat is more efficient. But when things break, you're in more trouble. Now, if you have a more diversified supply chain, shipping will be more expensive, the meat will be more expensive, but it doesn't break as easily. It's more robust. It's less prone to disruption. Let me tell you what's going on with the Ever Given. I've been tracking her. Uh, she's sitting in a, in a uh, wide part of the canal anchored because everybody is fighting over who's going to pay for it, blocking up the canal. Right. She's not moving. She's got 9,000 truckloads of freight on her. And they can't unload it in Egypt because they don't have a big enough crane. A smaller container ship, they would have just taken it to port in, right. in Egypt and low, offloaded the freight and it seized the ship. Mm -hmm. No, she's sitting in there with all the boxes on her. And mm -hmm. people are furious. And it's just sitting there. I checked it yesterday. It was still sitting there. It comes up on a map just like that. She hadn't moved. It's on the same coordinates. Wow. Big. Well, it's fragile. I don't know they, what's going to end up happening. They moved it from blocking the canal, though, right? Oh, no. It's not blocking the canal. Right. No. What they, you see, there's one skinny part of the canal where they have to take turns going through in single file. One way, right. right? Sort of like a construction site when you have those one-way lights. No, they took her up to another place where it's real wide, and she's anchored there, and just anchored there. And all the legal people are fighting. Unbelievable. The freight's not going anywhere because they, they have to take it to a major. Uh, they have to take it to a major port to unload it. So it's they. It's they, a little mess. Big. It's fragile. Right. They and use they, pilots and, in that canal or because, you know, in, in the Panama Canal, they pull them through with um, with cables. Right. No, no, no. They just I think what happened there. I used to live in the desert. I lived in Arizona for for 10 years and we'd get a dust storm. And this is back right. when I worked in construction. It come up like that. Right. Instant. Oh, sure. And we had a dust storm one time at a construction company I worked at and they made a corrugated metal siding like for two, you know, for cattle buildings and stuff like that right. and a dust storm whipped up and it whipped up the metal sheets the corrugated iron before they could secure it, it was flying all around the yard i was up we all ran in the offices we didn't want to get cut up by it and it just came up so fast they couldn't secure those metal sheets i wasn't watching them fly around what i think happened is that a dust storm whipped up and that ship is so big with all those boxes on mm -hmm. it, it acted as a sail and it just shoved it over. I think wow. that's what happened. And she's got bigger sisters, even bigger. That's I'll crazy. And there's ships being built that are even bigger. Oh, yeah. It, it'll never stop. You know, no, but never... the, it was, this is the problem. Big, it's fragile. No, no I now, know. A lot of the stuff that's on that boat isn't necessities. Do you really need another phone? Well, there's probably a container of phones and there's a container of bedroom slippers. Now, people are very angry about those bedroom slippers. Not I do them. need some. I need some bedroom slippers. So I'm, yep. I'm Well, the Ever Given's got a whole yeah. container load of Yeah, bedroom. well, uh, you know, look, I, I remember when the first Loxa ship came out, when they first figured out the container ship. And and remember that, Temple, it, it was like all, all the longshoremen started losing their jobs because once you were able to take one crane to, you know, time was money and they could just drop these containers in the Loxa ship, that ended the whole longshoreman situation, right? And now these ships are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's amazing what's going on out there now. Well, but then when something breaks, you see, now they got it out. The ship is not damaged. Mm -hmm. And uh, the visual thinking department didn't get enough credit. Those tugboat crews need a lot of credit. They would have had to have worked in unison to either push or pull all at the same time. Right. I, from, I, I learned, I've worked with a lot of brilliant people in construction. And they were the autistic kids, the dyslexic kids, the ADHD kids. They build the stuff. And they probably got the ever given out of the canal. Now the lawyers are fighting over it. And it's just sitting there. Well, I'm sure the lawyers are very happy. 
Uh, hang well, they're with, making all the money, and you've got they all always do on there just sitting there. Deb, well, hang on just a second. Um, we, we're gonna have to end this in a second, but I gotta. Uh, I have one more sponsor to talk about. You would love to sponsor, by the way, olive oil. Do you like olive oil? Yes, I do, actually. Yeah. Villa Capelli, they've been a sponsor of this show for 10 years. Villa Capelli olive oil. Folks, we were talking about GMP. This is another situation. I vetted this company when Paul Capelli was still with us. Villa Capelli is 100% pure olive oil from Puglia, Italy. Anna, my co-host, has actually been there to check out Villa Capelli in person. Villa Capelli olive oil, been with us a long time. In this country, you're able to cut olive oil up to 40% with rapeseed oil, flaxseed oil, whatever you want. Um, the Italians call it lampante, lamp oil. They can do that and get away with it and still call it 100% olive oil. Villa Capelli does not do that. You get 100% oil. As a matter of fact, I use their olive oil and my vitamin D product over at purevitaminclub.com. So go check it out. You want to save 10% at Villa Capelli? Promo code Vinny, 10%. V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y. V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y. Uh, also, folks, you want to check out, um, uh, you can go to vinnytotteries.com before you go to Amazon. It puts a little coal on the fire, gets my train down the track. All these books that Dr. Grandin was talking about today will be part of the Vinny Book Club. They will already be in there. If they're on Amazon, they will be in the Vinny Book Club. So you guys can check all of them out today. We will also have the name of those books in the show notes um, of this show. So you can check that out. Also, um, Dr. Grandin, where can people find you? Well, I've got two websites. I have templegrandin.com, which is my autism website. You can write to that. And then I also have got grandin.com, just my last name, that has all of my livestock uh, information. I can also uh, be looked up on the uh, Department of Animal Science um, website at Colorado State uh, University. And it's got, been really great uh, being here. I um, hope I got people thinking about some things. I just want to end up, big is not bad, big is fragile. There's a big difference here. Big works great until it breaks. And it makes it really economical. But you have a more distributed supply chain. It's going to be a lot more robust, less prone to breakage, but it's going to be more expensive. That's the trade-off. You heard it from the horse's mouth today, folks. Uh, Temple, hang on. I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air. Folks, uh, there you have it. Temple, I hope that you come back sometime because I feel like we just scratched the surface today. I can talk to you over and over again. Uh, I find you absolutely fascinating, and uh, I really enjoyed you coming on. On behalf of Temple Grandin, my name is Vinnie Totterich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>